So I thank uh, Professor Joshi for uh, inviting me here. Coming to Pune University or Pune in general is like homecoming for various reasons. Uh, I've been to Pune uh, University twice uh, last year. But uh, more seriously, uh, uh, much has been said about uh, you know a way of introduction. But uh, one thing did you realize that there is a strong uh, Pune-Mumbai connection regarding my career. So my research area is affine algebraic geometry or that is a major part of my research area. And my student Nina Gupta's fame is in affine algebraic geometry. And Sriram Abhankar is a pioneer in the area. In fact, in 2021-22, Nina was uh, given the prestigious Ramanujan Prize of ICTP. And a Fields medalist had introduced her. And in the introductory talk, uh, he mentioned that there are two streams uh, in algebraic geometry which are basically of uh, you know indian uh, indians have uh, pioneered that one is by the area of the vector bundles i mean ms narasimhan who who was also associated with icdp ms narasimhan belonged to tfr and the other is the stream started by abhankar and nina belongs to that stream so this was uh, mentioned in this ramanujan so and so it is quite uh, last year when i had come here there is a list of the head of the department um, somewhere here, and uh, it begins with Sri Rama Bhankar. So, the another thing is that today's talk is on history of mathematics. Sri Rama Bhankar founded the Bhaskaracharya Pratishtan, where uh, basically uh, my visit was to Bhaskaracharya Pratishtan this time. And I have been telling many people that probably Bhaskaracharya Pratishtan is the first major national institution named after an ancient Indian mathematician. So, and that is, uh, you can imagine that now, you know, ancient Indian mathematics is very much in the air, but 50 years ago, it, 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 it was highly original of him that, uh, to think of Bhaskaracharya. Some, uh, some people mentioned about an Aryabhata Institute of Astronomy, which was founded in 1954, but in 1954 it was not named after Aryabhata. The naming happened in 2004. So, uh, that is not a, a really a counter example. And the other, uh, Nina, uh, one other connection which I would mention is that uh, about Nina, it has been mentioned that uh, she solved the Zariski cancellation problem. And you uh, would be interested to know that Zariski was the PhD guide of Abhankar. And, they, and you know, Zariski uh, worked on resolution of singularities. And, uh, Abhe, uh, and of that, the positive characteristic case was very difficult. And so, when Abhankar sh showed interest, Zariski discouraged uh, him because he was just a PhD student. And later, Abhankar heard from a uh, third person that Zariski told him uh, that as a uh, PhD guide, it was my duty to discourage him. But I was secretly hoping that he will disobey me. <laughs> so, th these are some interesting anecdotes. Another uh, subject which has been mentioned about me is commutative algebra. You know, if one person has to be identified as the founder of commutative algebra, who is it? One of the greatest mathematician of all times, founder of commutative algebra. That's Amy Neuther. And in her memory, there are lectures uh, organized uh, every year by American Math Society. And uh, Nina has been invited uh, to give the next lecture, that means for 2025. And she is the first from an Indian institute to be invited and the third uh, of Indian origin. The other previously, per, Professor Parimala and Professor Bhima Srinivasan uh, have been invited, but they were in the US, uh, US universities. And she is also the youngest. So that is, 
another connection. Okay, so let us come to today's topic. So, usually when I am invited to deliver a talk on ancient Indian mathematics, I choose some specific theme. However, what I find is that somehow some flaw has to be found. So, for example, if I talk about mathematics of the Vedic time, then an impression gains ground that whatever happened was in the Vedic period, why nothing happened after that. If I talk about Brahmagupta, then as if mathematics started with Brahmagupta, there was nothing before that. In Vedic time, there was no mathematics or after that nothing happened. If I start talk about Madhavacharya, then again the same problem that is it is as if mathematics uh, in India started with that. So, let me give one talk which would kind of cover all the phases. Okay, now you it is like field placing, you feel place fielders in such a way that the batsman just does not get uh, any place to hit the ball. So, this is field placing, but more seriously the idea came from there was a national seminar on uh, 25th February 2022. It was uh, organized by the Ministry of Culture. Actually, Ministry of Culture in, uh, requested me and uh, Professor Rama Subramaniam of Bombay IIT to organize it. And the, all the lectures are on YouTube, so I would recommend watching that. The keynote address was given by Manjul Bhargav, you know, Fields Medalist Manjul Bhargav, and uh, we had invited him. And uh, Manjul Bhargav gave the talk that 10 ideas of in mathematics uh, from ancient Indian mathematics which every Indian should know. So, my today's talk is kind of uh, you can say inspired or motivated by that Manjul's uh, idea of singling out 10 ideas which every Indian should know, but I am modifying it, I am not giving Manjul's list, I am making my own list, because he omitted uh, certain things which are so sophisticated that uh, you know this you, one cannot say that every Indian should know it, it, it is just not possible. But what I would uh, my, my modified title is that some 10 or 12 ideas which every uh, every uh, math uh, every Indian interested in mathematics should know. So, that gives me scope for introducing uh, things which he had uh, omitted. And uh, before starting my slides, I let me read out something which I had uh, planned to introduce, but uh, as was mentioned that I was very be I meaning I had actually come for various activities. So, I forgot to include it but I have it in my mobile. So, I will read out because I think this is very useful for students. So, Mahavira Charya was mentioned by Professor Borse. He belonged to the 9th century around 850. Mahavira Charya made a list of qualities that distinguishes a mathematician. So, a mathematician can be recognized by the following 8 qualities. So, this gives you an ideal, you know that if, if you have to be a mathematician, you have to be this and it is not one quality, eight and the eight have to be taken together. So, the first is, he is endowed with the ability to simplify and to express concisely. This distinguishes mathematicians, uh, how concisely you express. And in you know in certain fields or in the humanities there is a tendency the same thing uh, to expand and expand. Maths is uh, about conciseness, but you see I am too uh, it becomes very difficult for me to talk without mentioning Abhengar somehow or the other he comes up. So, I heard uh, I was not there this is, was a long time but a senior colleague in ISI had attended the talk. So, he was mentioning about uh, a Japanese mathematician Nagata, who was noted for this conciseness in his mathematics. Uh, uh, I mean mathematicians are supposed to be precise and concise, but he was very exceptional in that. And one thing I should tell you is that Abhankar was often 
uh, made uncomplimentary statements about uh, certain trends in modern mathematics that use of too much of language and uh, fancy language where you know the soul gets lost. So, he had the reservations about that. So, he made a dig at this. So, he said what a good mathematician will express in 10 pages and a fancy mathematician in 100 pages Nagata will express in 10 lines. And so, this is Abhankar of 20th century okay. and that is mentioned here in 9th century first quality that a mathematician is endowed with the ability to simplify and to express concisely. The second is of course, routine I think uh, if you are asked to write an essay on who is a mathematician all of you would be mentioning this. He is endowed with the ability to deduce results nothing I mean this is something you are familiar, but the first one is was something I would like to emphasize second one I all of you know. Third requires emphasis, he is endowed with the ability to disprove statements like uh, you know Nina actually Zariski made a statement. So, up to n equal to 1 and 2 big mathematicians and proved that they are valid and Nina proved that from 3 onwards it is invalid. So, ability to disprove statements, statements which are invalid. He is endowed with vigor in work and progress. So, vigor in work and progress you associate with sports people. So, if you want to be mathematician, if you want to be solid mathematician, you have to have the ability to work hard. Talent is not enough and uh, one image again comes is Abhankar, he passed away at the age of 82 on his working table. He was working at that time when he had the heart attack and he was working at a very high technical level. I mean his last works were not you know very philosophical or anything, it is very technical mathematics. So, he is endowed with vigor and work in, uh, in work and progress. He is endowed with the power of com comprehension. Uh, this may sound uh, banal, but it is not banal. In mathematics up to you know in, in the lower stages it looks very pleasant uh, school mathematics may be even college mathematics, but as you go uh, into the research level you are kind of uh, you have an ocean in front of you and then it matters at how fast you comprehend things get into the spirit of the thing because uh, see now we have understood ancient mathematics math, I do not mean ancient Indian, but uh, any mathematicians prior to 18th century we have a good understanding, but things which are happening now to get into the frontier this required a tremendous power of comprehension and this would have been valid in every era. That is now this is something which is very very relevant now particularly with this NCRT uh, project I have serious reservations and here Mahaviracharya is on in my camp. He is endowed with the power of retention, endowed with the power of retention, memorization this was very very important in ancient India the culture of memorization. Now, as I told you and this goes along with comprehension, comprehension and memorization goes together because now what happens is that the amount of mathematics that you have to know to make any progress uh, to go get into the frontier is huge. Now, suppose you study uh, something for one month then what, uh, what you have read one month earlier you forget then you know in spite of your talent uh, it does not. So, memorization ability to memorize is very important and this I am emphasizing because there is almost a crusade because people students in school often you know mug up things without understanding and repeat it in the exam. So, this has to be stopped 
and therefore anything requiring memorization there is a move to abolish that and uh, if you know the NCRT becomes successful in doing that this would be a big harm so I am telling you inside story there are people who say that there is no use of memorizing multiplication table ok. So, if that really happens you privately you know spread the word that this have to be <laughs> memorized. Memorization is very important look at Mahaviracharya, but unfortunately Mahaviracharya was not taught ever and therefore people do not know that this is needed to uh, excel in mathematics power of retention. Next he is endowed with the ability to find solutions of problems. This is something I do not have to elaborate mathematics is about finding solution to problems this is something people know, but there is another very subtle thing and it is amazing that 9th century mathematician talked about that. He is endowed with the ability to discover mathematical facts through investigations. So, one thing is uh, in our school education throughout what has been emphasized is that you know that you are told something and then you are set exercises and some of the exercises could be difficult. But what it means is that when somebody proposes a statement then you try to prove or disprove it, but on your own can you discover facts which nobody had thought of the ability to discover facts. So, I will give uh, so examples will come up, uh, but in case I forget this Brahma Gupta he came up with the idea of composition this is not a solution. So, it was of course, in the context of uh, solution to a problem, but the point is that in the process he discovered I mean he opened up a new vista of mathematics. So, this uh, making discoveries or in other words there are two things in mathematics one is the you know solving problems and the other is building theories. These are complementary things and those who build theories sometimes look down uh, upon solution to problem, oh, but this does not give insights, but actually if somebody by his ingenuity solves a problem only then insights come up. So, these are complementary things anyway. So, now with this perspective let us uh, uh, start with uh, some of the highlights of ancient Indian mathematics. The first is of course, the decimal system this has been talked about at length the importance of the decimal system, but I will give a little twist to it. Decimal system has two forms one is the oral the number names which go back to at least the Vedic periods. So, when people praise the decimal system it is the decimal notation that is praised, but the number of vocabulary the I mean expressing numbers in decimal system in words that also involves real sophistication in mathematical thinking. So, what are the key ideas in the number vocabulary? So, the Vedic number vocabulary is the same as the current Sanskrit number vocabulary. One word term for each primary number eka, dvi, tri, chatur like that up to nava. One word term for each power of 10 up to 10 to the power 12 and later there are uh, even higher uh, things, but I am talking about in the Vedic period terminology went up to 10 to the world. Now, it is important that there is one word term dasha, shata, shahasra, ayuta the list goes on up to paradha. In English you do not have that you have what 10, 100, 1000 after that it is 10,000 that is not a single word. So, therefore, it does not play the role of place value it is not a precursor of the place value which ayuta is. So, having single word term for each power of 10 
so this is so decimal system two aspects one is the number names and the other is the notation how far back it goes at least first century ad it could be even earlier the key ideas are place value this is of course uh, you should have you must have studied in school for example when you say 1940 uh, the one in is in the fourth place from the right so fourth place from the right gives it the value 1000 so that is uh, so one is attaining the value 1000 by its place by its position now this is again not emphasized one symbol for one digit because of that decimal notation became what it is and this is also inspired by the sanskrit alphabet you see you, you know what is the characteristic uh, of sanskrit alphabet that one sound one symbol the sound ka has only one representation and similarly that representation means only ka nothing no other sound this is something if you since you all of you know english you can see that uh, 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 it doesn't hold in any of the direction that given say the sound ka it may be written as c or it may be written as k and you see it can be uh, ka it can be cha also so that's not the case with sanskrit and that is the feature here that one symbol for one digit in roman you know that uh, let us say four it requires uh, two symbols three requires three symbols and then the zero symbol for any absent uh, power so this is unique feature of the decimal system is that there is a brilliance in mathematical abstraction as well as it is a practical device normally what happens is that you have something which is profound mathematics and then there is something like an application like let us say uh, newton's laws of gravitation let us say so that is not a, uh, that is not a device the rocket is a device but the rocket is not uh, you know uh, an abstract principle so these two are separate that you have a theoretical something theoretical and then it is uh, applied the so technology and science these are two different things there is science and then it is applied but here this is something which is both profound mathematics as well as an application and this is very unique uh, in uh, uh, i mean an uh, unique feature in the entire science that something which is itself and thought and is itself a device now on vedic number vocabulary this is never emphasized in the history of mathematics its uh, thing the its importance and surprisingly one place where it i found it is in uh, writing of swami vivekananda that the 10 numerals that means a decimal system the very cornerstone of all present civilization now this is something which has been ma mentioned uh, by acknowledged by many people that the decimal system is at the is a pillar of the modern civilization were discovered in india and are in reality sanskrit words so because from the vedic number vocabulary to arrive at decimal notation what you have to do is that just suppress the names for the powers of 10 automatically you get place value and then have symbols for each of the words one symbol for one digit and if there is something missing then you put a zero symbol for that so with these three ideas the decimal notation comes very naturally from the vedic number vocabulary and this is by pointed out by swami vivekananda that the decimal system is in reality sanskrit words the zero has been of course uh, given much uh, praise and one interesting thing is that halsted an american mathematician uh, makes an uh, allusion to Shakespeare uh, so uses phrase from Shakespeare's uh, Midsummer Night's Dream that this zero uh, the uh, importance of the creation of the zero mark can never be exaggerated here he, what he is emphasizing is the zero as a place marker 
this giving to hearing nothing not merely a local habitation and a name a picture a symbol but helpful power is the characteristic of the Hindu race when it is sprang it is like coining the nirvana into dynamos no single mathematical creation has been more potent for the general ongo of intelligence and power. Now, zero has uh, various aspects. Now, here the aspect which is talked about is zero as a place marker, but there is another more profound aspect of zero, zero as a number. So, which I will come to a little later. Now, decimal system has been talked about quite a bit, but what is not realized is that the basic arithmetic which is taught in school methods of addition, subtraction, multiplication, long division, squares, cubes, square root, cube root all are slight modification of the Indian methods. So, you know the program Kon Banega Kroorpati, Amitabh Bachchan's. So, there a mathematics teacher, school teacher was uh, invited and it is there in the YouTube, you can locate it. Last year, yes, sometime in August maybe, uh, in August 2023 I think this, uh, this had appeared. So, the maths teacher was asked that the, uh, by Amitabh Bachchan that you know maths is such a difficult subject and uh, how do you lie? Uh, <laughs> why and how you like it and he gave a very interesting answer. He proved that mathematics is uh, not at all di difficult because he says that look at the children. I mean those who are going into academic specialization not that, but those who are uh, not into academics. What is it that they, uh, what, what are the things which, uh, which they learn in school that they remember throughout their life? So, a historian of course remembers the history and knows, know, uh, knows more and mathematician uh, remembers the mathematicians, but general common, common uh, uh, public who are not into studies, they remember only one thing among all the things which are studied in school, taught in school, how to add, subtract, multiply and divide. This is something they know never forget. So, how can mathematics be difficult? That's a fantastic answer he gave, but what he did not mention is, see addition, subtraction, multiplication, division need not be easy. Try to do multiplication by the Roman methods is really difficult. And the children would not have remembered it. The point is that what they remember throughout their life, what is taught in school was invented by the Indians. Those methods were invented by the Indians, this was not mentioned there. So, you have to realize this importance and this is because of the you know uh, point that the maths teacher mentioned that it is so easy that this has led to the proletarization of knowledge. See earlier it is a Greeks you say that Greeks were very great etcetera, but this uh, knowledge was restricted to you know very small uh, circle. Most people in Greece, I am emphasizing Greece because you know Greeks had a very high culture, intellectual culture, but that was limited to very few people. And compared to the modern West, modern West you know everybody seems to be an expert. I mean, I mean this knowledge, knowledge has spread so much, but that was after Renaissance. And what was one of the factors of Renaissance, the decimal system. So, that made science and such things accessible to a large people because this basics of calculations that was easy, that was made easy. And this has been emphasized by you know mathematicians like Laplace. So, for example, the square root method of Aryabhata that appears in Catania in 1546. And incidentally the word algorithm that originally referred to the step by step systematic procedure of the Indians, Indian methods of uh, arithmetic, because this alpha is me elaborated on the Indian methods. And so, the Indian methods of computation that came to be called algorithmy as a you know from the name alpha is me. And this algorithmy became algorithmus 
So, algorithm refers to operations based on decimal system and then that became algorithm that became algorithm. Operations with fractions a by b plus c by d is a d plus b c by b d. These rules came from India. Other civilizations used only unit fractions. Rules on ratio and proportion like rule of 3 it was called Trerajsika in India and this was regarded as a golden rule during uh, European renaissance. Com commercial arithmetic income and expenditure profit and loss simple and compound interest discount partnership computation of the average impurity of gold speed and distance mixture and system problems. These things went from India to Europe via Arabs weighted arithmetic mean for depth of irregular shaped pool of water and this uh, this was a this occurs in Brahmagupta and this was a step towards the inv cal invention of calculus in India. Incidentally, uh, just yesterday I was saying about my role in mathematics, my role was like that of Arabs. I learnt algebra because in our region eastern region there was you know algebra was uh, this uh, TIFR kind of algebra was virtually non-existent in our area. So, I learnt algebra from Pune people Professor Bhattwadik <laughs> and uh, which was you know uh, in that Professor Abhankar's tradition and then went and uh, started uh, introducing algebra there and now you have Nina Gupta etcetera from ISI. So, it would appear no what would appear is that Nina Gupta was is a complete product of Indian statistical institute. So, you know this is very strong place Calcutta is a very strong place in algebra, but it is actually because I like Arabs I transmitted it from <laughs> this West India. Anyway. Oh, I actually I did not realize that the quotation from Laplace is there that it is India that gave us the ingenious method of expressing all numbers by means of 10 symbols each symbol receiving a value of position as well as absolute value a profound and important idea which appears so simple to us now that we uh, ignored its true merit. Its very simplicity the great ease which it has lent to all computations put our edit puts our arithmetic in the first rank of useful inventions what the host of Amitabh Bachchan was telling that this is in, in school whatever you uh, taught the most useful invention taught in school is the basic arithmetic and how sophisticated that is that you can appreciate we shall appreciate the grandeur of this achievement the more when we remember that it escaped the genius of Archimedes and Apollonius two of the greatest men produced by antiquity. And yes this early learning of arithmetic at a tender age has enabled a universal dissemination of scientific and technical knowledge in society no longer it is restricted to the scholarly elite. And if you see you know decimal system was uh, standardized in Europe in early 17th century, but 500 years before that Fibonacci was strongly advocating decimal system, but it was resisted for 500 years by the church. Because what happens is that the, uh, there was a, some kind of monopoly of knowledge that only very few people who would be able to do the computation. So, uh, they would be in demand, but if everybody uh, can do basic things then the power would go away. So, there was a resistance for 500 years. So, just uh, think of uh, something like the number 888 it requires 12 uh, symbols to write and if you try to write million you, uh, it is not just uh, physically possible in the Roman system. Now, What is the topic which is at the heart of algebra? Polynomials. In fact, uh, and because you know the polynomial, it will be in modern mathematics, uh, what a banker will call fancy language. Everything is actually polynomials, but that will be hidden under various subterfuges. So, instead of polynomial, you will study field extensions, but this is all story about polynomials. So, Abhankar wrote a poem 
polynomials and power series may they forever rule the world. It starts with that and who is associated with polynomials in West in the European mathematics. So, again I will tell you an anecdote uh, in Calcutta mathematical society somebody was uh, asking about who is the founder of algebraic geometry. So, uh, the algebraic approach to algebraic geometry of Bengus is uh, Dedekind. So, I was asking that can't you attribute it to Newton who comes earlier. So, Bengus is Newton, Newton with his polynomials and power series is the founder of everything in modern mathematics. So, how you restrict him to algebraic geometry. So, what I am trying to say is that Newton with Newton is associated polynomials and power series, uh, but polynomials was there already in India in Brahma Gupta and power series is, was there in Madhavacharya that uh, that is another matter. Now, the point is that how Newton introduced polynomials, what was Newton's own statement since the operations of computing in numbers and with variables are closely similar, I was amazed that it has occurred to no one to fit the doctrine recently established for decimal numbers. As I said the decimal system became standard just before Newton in similar fashion to variables especially since the way is then open to more striking consequences. For since this doctrine in species, doctrine in species means this uh, mathematics with x y z, species refers to x y z has the same relationship to algebra that the doctrine in decimal numbers has to common arithmetic its operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division and root extraction may be easily learned from the latters. So, therefore, you understand that the decimal system and this refers to not just the written decimal system, it also applies to the oral. This contains in it the seed of the idea of polynomial. In fact, the decimal system is a tenadic polynomial system. And Newton is on record that uh, the polynomial can easily be learned from the decimal system. So, you can see that how algebraic the concept of decimal system is. Now, let us uh, change the topic, let us move to geometry. So, this was mentioned by Professor Borse that Pythagoras theorem is stated in Baudhana Sulva Sutra as a statement about the diagonal of a rectangle. The diagonal of a rectangle, the square on the diagonal of a rectangle uh, gives the same area that the length and breadth gives separately. But here I would like to point out something that in order to highlight the greatness of uh, mathematics of the Vedic time or Indian mathematics, people scream that Pythagoras theorem was stated by Baudhaya, which is a fact of course, but that is something like I would say undermining the Sulva Sutras. That means, you have a body of work and if you just pick up something minor and highlight that, that, that as if it is that it is much more than statement of Pythagoras theorem occurring. The point is that how it is applied the sophist because Pythagoras theorem why I am saying Pythagoras theorem is at the pillar of Euclidean geometry, but the point is the statement of Pythagoras theorem does not in, it, in itself indicate sophistication because Pythagoras theorem one can argue that probably it was an observational statement that you observe several right angles that this uh, thing happens and then you make a statement without any idea that why it works, but it is not that. Look at the sophistication in construction. So, I will so there are several sophisticated construction I will give you one example both. So, so Pythagoras theorem definitely has to be mentioned among the landmarks, but along with that what has to be mentioned in geometric algebra in Vedic constructions geometric algebra, algebra in geometric form. Look at Baudhan's construction of a square, which is equal in area to a given rectangle of sides a b. You will see, so I will show the square in the next slide. 
that it gives you an exact construction of root a b. So, a and b are given you have to construct root a b. So, for example, 5 and 7 are given you have to construct root 35. Other civilizations, so they say that you know India did not have the monopoly of anything, I mean there was Babylonia, there was Egypt, but they would just take the approximation value, value of root 35. Here you see exact construction. Use of this uh, Baudhana's uh, theorem and what you will see is geometric expression of the algebraic formula a b is a plus b by 2 whole square minus a minus b by 2 whole square. The formal algebra comes up during the time of Brahmagupta and the greatness of the Vedic thinkers is that they invented mathematics which is algebraic in spirit and substance much before formal algebra was invented. That does not make them lesser algebraists, that makes them much greater as algebraists. It is like Gauss is regarded as a formidable mathematician because he gave group theoretic results before group theory was invented. Nobody says that Graf was, uh, Gauss was not aware of group theory. The fact that group theory did not come out in the open before Gauss and yet he gave group theoretic results that makes him greater as a mathematician. But when it comes to uh, this thing that no, no, both then at that time algebra had not come up. But algebra did not come up means x, y, z had not come up. But x, y, well, without x, y, z to make such a identities that requires a phenomenal caliber. And Seidenberg who was a great mathematician as well as a historian of mathematics pointed out that this construction which I am going to show is entirely in the spirit of the Euclid, Euclid's elements. In fact, Seidenberg says it is more in the spirit of Euclid's elements than the Euclid's book itself. So, what is this construction? So, let us look at this. This is the rectangle, this is the side A and this is the side B. So, this is the original rectangle and you have to construct a square whose area is equal to this. So, what Bandhan says is that you complete the smaller square. So, this square is B square. So, therefore, this part is this length is a minus b, then he says that you bisect it. So, this part is a minus b by 2. So, this is a minus b by 2 and this is b. Therefore, this whole thing up to this point becomes a plus b by 2. Now, you draw this arc of radius a plus b by 2 and see where it meets the extension of this line. So, it meets here. Then what have you got? this part is a plus b by 2, this part is a minus b by 2 and then they say that take this which is root a b. This is Baudhan's Silva Sutra. So, you can see the sophistication of the level of mathematical sophistication Yeah, I am coming to that. So, so you see that uh, how unfair it would be to restrict your screaming to say that Pythagoras theorem was known in India. In what form it was applied? If you do not emphasize then what is the use? To the common man you have to like Manjul Bhargav, Manjul Bhargav of course talked only about Pythagoras theorem because he was talking to the common man. You cannot explain all these things to the common man, but when you are talking in a more scholarly circuit. There you have to emphasize this and not Pythagoras theorem. The level, level of application of Pythagoras theorem and people who uh, you know come up with such, uh, such constructions obviously knew, they knew that why the Pythagoras theorem works. Now, as far as the dating is concerned this occurs in Bodhan Sulva Sutra which is dated roughly 800 BC. But 800 BC is not the time of invention because all these things are in the context of the Vedic fire altars. Sulva Sutras merely uh, records the mathematical knowledge of the Vedic time. So, you have to see that how old is the fire altars where these constructions are applied. So, that goes back to the actual Vedas because the 
Shatapatha Brahmana and Taitriya Samhita describes the fire altars, does not make the mathematical statements but describes the altars for which these uh, things are required. So, this goes back to the Vedic period, real Vedic period. Now, the point is that the dating of the Vedic period, there is of course two schools of thought, one starts with 1500 BC and the other starts with 3000 BC. That is something the evidence is uh, you know so little that uh, there is nothing clinching in favor of either of them. But my, in, uh, so, uh, my feeling is that it m must be closer to 3000 BC for the simple reason that there is so much gap between the Rig Veda and the Sulva Sutra that if Rig Veda is 1200 then Sulva Sutra cannot be 800. So, if Sulva Sutra is 800, Rig Veda cannot be 1200, it has to be much earlier. This is uh, I mean my heuristic thinking. By the way, yesterday I had to, uh, give a, delivered a talk in ISER and where I had discussed all this and then I quoted a Nobel laureate of in, uh, uh, Indian, in fact he is an Indian citizen who says that there was no sophisticated mathematics during the Vedic period, just like that he says and it is only the partisan people who say about mathematical sophistication, even he uh, names that uh, you know BJP uh, I mean except for people who are partisan who are BJP etc etc. So, what I did was that I quoted from Jawaharlal Nehru's discovery of India where he uses the term I mean he says that you know the geometry origin of geometry goes back to the remote period origin of both geometry and algebra and he even uses the expression geometric algebra he is used in Vedic rituals. So, I was men making this point that it is a shame that Jawaharlal Nehru who was not a mathematician, he was a great scholar, but he was not a you know technical mathematician. He appreciated this geometric algebra and makes it a point to make it in discovery of India, write in discovery of India the expression geometric algebra and the mathematicians do not know about it. There is something seriously wrong. And I would uh, strongly recommend that uh, people to do look at uh, uh, there is a separate section on mathematics in ancient India in discovery of India. People should look at that what a general scholar who is not a specialist mathematician what he appreciated and wrote down. Of course, I then looking at the axioms set up by the Nobel laureate. I came to the conclusion that Jawaharlal Nehru is BJP because he says that only BJP <laughs> people say it and Jawaharlal Nehru says that mathematics in Vedic time was very sophisticated. So, my uh, logical conclusion is that Jawaharlal Nehru is BJP. <laughs> now, as I said that, uh, so let us uh, Uh, so, one thing let us admit certain things. Geometry in Vedic period was very remarkable for its age, you know you can see the kind of sophistication that there was. But after that when the Greeks did geometry between 600 to 300 BC and maybe it, uh, up to uh, Euclid comes in 300 BC up to 300 AD say not more than that. The progress that they made in geometry is phenomenal and no subsequent civilization matches the height which the Greeks attained in geometry. So, if you look at the post Vedic mathematics in India, then overall in geometry it does not uh, you know come up to the Greek level. So, for example, in Archimedes was uh, you know making serious research on uh, conic sections you know parabola ellipse etc without the facilities of coordinate geometry and indians were interested but mahaviracharya whose name is mentioned uh, struggled with these things but uh, his results were nowhere uh, close to uh, results of archimedes but so what i'm saying is that geometry proper was not uh, you know, that remarkable in post vedic India, but there are certain exceptions. The bulk, it is not a very big bulk. Exceptions are the properties of cyclic quadrilaterals. There are results from by Brahma Gupta and his successors and which you do not find in Greece. 
and they come in modern Europe much later. So, you know, Ptolemy is theorem is uh, sometimes taught to advanced students in school that if you take A, B, C, D to be the sides of a cyclic quadrilateral, then the product of the diagonals is A, C plus B, D. This is called Ptolemy's theorem and this is usually in, you know, special mathematics one, uh, it is usually not uh, uh, taught in compulsory mathematics. But Brahmagupta gave the actual length of the diagonals in terms of A, B, C, D, the formula is displayed there. And if you multiply the two, then you can get the, you can see that you get uh, the Ptolemy's theorem. This is in Brahmagupta and this was rediscovered in Europe thousand years later by, you know, Snell's laws of refraction. You learn in physics uh, that Snell. Then you learn about Heron's formula for a triangle. The idea of a triangle is uh, root over s into s minus a s minus b s minus c where s is the semi perimeter. But Brahmagupta gave, uh, I mean this is a special case of Brahmagupta's theorem for cyclic quadrilateral where if s is the perimeter, uh, not semi perimeter root of s minus a s minus b s minus c s minus d. So, there are some such, then uh, Parameshwara, I cannot even pronounce these things, Parameshwara gave formula for circumradius which is now known as Lewis formulas that is 792 and then there are remarkable results by Narayana. So, uh, so le let me again emphasize that overall uh, you know the Greek geometry is unmatched, but in India there are certain remarkable results in geometry, geometry too. The other thing one should remember is that what you really under um, I mean call geometry that uh, the, that is not so much of remarkable results like this, but uh, there is geometric thinking in Indian mathematics. For example, the calculus which was done in India that approach was really geometry. So, there was sophisticated geometric thinking in India, but not the kind of results you see in Euclid, Archimedes or Apollonius except for this. And the other thing you have to realize about Indian uh, contribution to world mathematics is that okay, Greeks did uh, great geometry, but how long? Only as I said up to 380. After that, they did not do much. Why? One reason is of course, there was a you know civilizational decline, but there is a more subtle mathematical factor. The height reached by uh, Greeks beyond that it was not possible to do further with the means at their disposal because it required a new approach. The new approach is the approach to algebra. So, there was a resurgence of geometry when algebra was introduced in Europe and then coordinate geometry came up. And what were Indians doing? So, in, I said post Vedic uh, mathematics does not match the um, you know Greek geometry except these results, but post Vedic mathematicians focused on the right thing, what you know lord of mathematics would have liked uh, human beings to do, develop algebra, because only then geometry would develop and Indians were doing precisely that. Algebra was developed in India and then it, uh, it was, uh, I mean once it, uh, Europe uh, learned it, they, uh, there was uh, you know resurgence in uh, geometry. Next is foundations of algebra. So, this was my talk at the Bhaskaracharya Pratishtan, one hour talk which I have to summarize in five minutes. So, Fields medalist, David Mumford is Fields medalist and David Mumford is a guru bhai of Sri Ramabhankar. He was also a student of Oscar Zariski and uh, he had very close TFR connections, he used to visit TFR. So, much of TFR mathematics is uh, influenced by Mumford also. So, Phil, um, David Mumford said that it seems, as so he wrote in a letter to me, it seems clear to me that Brahma Gupta is the key person in the creation of algebra as we know it. So, what are the features of Brahma Gupta? which makes him the founder of algebra. So, first of all, for the first time, you see a recognition of algebra as a distinct important discipline. So, prior to Brahma Gupta, you see that for example, in the Sulva Sutras itself, there is an algebraic thinking, but there is, but they have not crystallized 
it into a distinct subject. Same with uh, Aryabhata or Diophantus, those who were great algebraists, but they did not single out algebra as a distinct discipline which Brahmagupta did. Brahmagupta introduced symbols for different unknowns. Diophantus had only one symbol for all unknowns. You can imagine the confusion that uh, th that would create. Brahmagupta said that you use the color names for different variables and use the first letter of the colors as the symbol. So, for example, there was a term for uh, unknown called Yavatavat. So, the first letter is Ya. So, Ya was the X. Then after that colors start like Kalaka is the term for uh, the second variable. So, Ka is the first letter. So, Ka is the your Y. Nilaka is the term for the third variable. So, Ni is the symbol for uh, the third variable Z let us say. Then how equations is to be formed? The idea of formation and processing of equations that uh, was done by Brahmagupta and of course, this will take time to illustrate. So, which I had done in the in my talk at Bhaskaracharya. Then algebra of polynomials in several unknowns that is take polynomials in several unknowns how to add, multiply, subtract all these things rules are given in Brahmagupta. 0 as a number. So, I was quoting Halstead, he was talking about 0 as the place uh, you know place marker, but as a number as an integer as a minus a as a into 0 equal to 0. Those of you who are doing college algebra one can say the ring theoretic aspect of 0 as an additive identity in the ring of integers that aspect you see the first time in Brahmagupta. Incidentally, the 0 in place marker there is a controversy that that uh, how do you say that it is of Indian origin it occurs in other civilizations like late Babylonia it occurs 0 as a place marker Mayan civilization it occurs and uh, you can see uh, it uh, here and there, but 0 as a number with operations placing it on the same footing as positive numbers, placing negative numbers on the same footing as positive numbers. This is something it begins with Brahmagupta. Explicit general formula for roots of arbitrary quadratic equations, elimination of middle that means completing the square. So, quadratic equation was called Madhyam Harana that is elimination of middle because uh, completing the square means there is uh, you if you say a x square plus b x plus c the trick is how to eliminate b. Gaussian method of elimination for simultaneous linear equations all these things occur in Brahmagupta. Now, this is uh, you know Burbaki is a group of uh, mathematicians who wrote under the common name very rigorous mathematics. So, they also have a book on history of mathematics there this point is emphasized. Our actual decimal system is derived from Hindu mathematics, where its use is attested already from the first centuries of our era. It must be noted moreover that the conception of 0 as a number and not as a simple symbol of separation and its introduction into calculations also count among the original contributions of the Hindus. And this second part is unique to India, you do not find it in late Babylonia, Greece, Egypt, whatever you call. Now, we come to things uh, which are more sophisticated and therefore, you know this you cannot say that every Indian should know it. So, one is integer solution of linear equations. So, suppose a, b, c are positive integers as a GCD of a, b divides c. Then Aryabhata gave what is called the Kutaka method for finding all positive integers x, y such that a x minus b y equal to c. And every positive integer and this is equivalent to the problem every positive integer x which when divided by b 1 leaves remainder r 1, when divided by b 2 leaves remainder r 2 etcetera. Find a positive integer x which when divided by b i leaves uh, given remainder r i. Now, this is called Chinese remainder theorem but it occurs in full detail in Aryabhata and after that there is lot of uh, work from Aryabhata onwards in the Indian tradition. 
So, here uh, I mean since we have been talking serious things for a long time. So, let me tell you something amusing for a change. So, so a few years ago during this COVID period you know that there was a skirmish with uh, China in the border. There was some fight ok. Galwan. Galwan yeah. And those were lockdown or you know work from home days that is people could not move around uh, the covid was all all over though and so government says that if it is not really necessary do not step out of your house. So, those days inside house what could people do what is up right. So, that time what is up was the main activity. So, you know and then this war, war was going I mean not war, but a battle was going on. So, people in WhatsApp groups gave a call to boycott anything from China ok very heroically. Then there would be some thinkers who know who get very hurt or offended if there is any statement made against China and particularly in mathematics there are many such people. So, they hit back that therefore, shall we stop using Chinese remainder theorem. <laughs> so, somebody forwarded this to me. I said what? Why should you stop uh, uh, using this theorem? You should use Aryabhata's theorem. <laughs> this is due to Aryabhata. Chinese may have got independently, but what is engineer uh, in uh, what it is called that engine that means uh, Indigenous, indigenous. Yeah, of course, it is ingenious also, ingenious as well as indigenous. So, indigenous, uh, 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 the, these things are our things. Chinese are, uh, might have discovered it independently. So, there is no problem in uh, using that. So, of course, uh, those mathematicians did not like it. By the way, so more seriously, this was used in uh, astronomy in predicting periodic events like eclipses, because eclipse occurs due to simultaneous occurrence of certain e uh, events right. And this problem uh, what is known as the Chinese remainder theorem is about the simultaneous solution. So, uh, so this was the ancient application in astronomy in calendar making and in modern time in coding theory in what is called cryptography, this is uh, the solution of the equations like A x minus B y equal to 1, where A and B the G C D is 1. This is a fundamental step in modern cryptography. So, this is of course, it will the whole thing will take uh, about uh, 90 minutes to talk about. And this Aryabhata's Kutaka method, it illustrates the divide and conquer strategy in computer science. That is how to break up a problem into a smaller part of the same type and just keep on breaking, breaking till it uh, you get an obvious solution and then work back. So, this is the divide and conquer strategy you have an illustration of that. This appears in the work of Bache in 1621 and subsequent European algebras. You know Bache is the person who inspired Fermat to number theory. So, for example, uh, there is this statement uh, there is this anecdote that Fermat wrote in the margin of a book that this uh, margin is too narrow to write down my book, but what was the book that he was reading? It is the Bashes book, Bashes book on Diophantus. No, Chinese see the uh, point is that uh, let us go uh, take it one by one India and China. In India it occurs in Aryabhata. Now, anything which occurs in Aryabhata, it, it cannot be dated in the sense that Aryabhata's date is 500 AD, 499. But Aryabhata's book does not, it is like Euclid's elements. So, whatever is there in Euclid does not mean that Euclid invented it. It is a culmination of the work of his predecessors. The same is with Aryabhata and Aryabhata acknowledges that, that I am describing the honor, uh, knowledge which is honored at Kusumapura, which is modern Pataliputra. Now, why the work before Aryabhata has not survived? There were important mathematicians before Aryabhata, which is mentioned by Aryabhata's commentator Bhaskara 1. 
but their work has not been their work has not survived why they have not survived that's a deliberate thing you see to in ancient times you didn't have the printing it was very difficult to preserve something so how you could preserve that is either through memorization that whatever verses are there the teacher teach uh, memorizes to the pupils and the other is to write that is very painfully on the bark of a tree or i mean on things uh, prepared from the bark of a tree or palm leaf manuscripts which don't last and since they don't last they have to be copied so therefore you have to be very selective in preserving things because you have you know whole volume of knowledge which has to be preserved and it's difficult to preserve it so regarding technical things what has happened is that aryabhata uh book it contains the essence of everything which their predecessors have written so therefore they didn't bother to preserve the work of the predecessors that is again copy what was uh, mathematicians before aryabhata so therefore we don't know what was the knowledge in 300 ad 200 ad 100 ad like that so after sulva sutras the major text is uh, aryabhata the in between knowledge has got lost that what was known when so this is about uh, india that it, it is definitely known to aryabhata aryabhata is called uh, described it but he de- described it so tersely that it must be older now if you go to china then it is very uh, crazy the chinese the remainder theorem is stated sometime in 12th century however there is a problem going to 3rd century about this simultaneous but that's a numerical problem whose answer is uh, you know that x will be 23 uh, what is the number which when divided by this gives remainder this i don't remember the details but the final answer is 23 so that is not very a clinching evidence so it may be a special case of chinese remainder theorem or 23 is such a number that you, you can uh, you can get it by inspection so therefore the chinese history is vague that when they invented the chinese remainder theorem that uh, is not very clear from chinese evidence india you are on solid ground that it was invented by the time of aryabhata and that's earlier than anything in china doesn't mean the chinese didn't know it before but i'm saying that there is no hard evidence and this uh, aryabhata's method it resembles the celebrated principle of descent of pharma now i come to just i show you a research monograph this is not a book in history of mathematics a research monograph very highly specialized by manuel ohangaran manuel ohangaran used to visit tr for the wheat group and the problem of luroth now look at the chapter titles okay suddenly chapter 5 is titled also sprag brahmagupta that means thus spek brahmagupta and brahmagupta's verses are quoted because he says in 5 chapter 18 that means brahma sputa siddhanta brahmagupta proves in the slightly different formulation quoted about the following lemma so this statement is in that modern fancy language what brahmagupta has expressed here and so why this is mentioned here is because this is the foundation of this chapter 5 the first result the second result is by fister okay generalized brahmagupta lemma as follows so from this evidence can you guess what would be fister's time date brahmagupta's time is 628 then his result is generalized by fister and he is narrating that so what could be fister's date which century you cannot say exact uh, thing some guess 16th, 16th. okay this uh, paper 33 was written in 1965 this is just to indicate where brahmagupta's work belongs now we come to our manjul bhargav so before fields medal he got other prizes like uh, there is a prestigious prize in number theory called coal prize and manjul bhargav gave higher composition laws 
so his work was praised citation praises his work so then manjul bhargava replies to that so he acknowledged the paper cited above build on ideas that go way back starting with the mathematical works of brahmagupta gauss dirichlet eisenstein and dedekind and leading up to the works of modern mathematicians by modern he means 20th century onwards i gratefully acknowledge my indebtedness to all these mathematicians so again i'll ask you that what was the time period of the mathematicians who manjul mentions brahmagupta is 628 the next person is gauss 1801 dirichlet 1838 Eisenstein 1844, Dedekind in 1871. So you can see the odd man there that that uh, things which belong to 19th century you suddenly see a spark occurring in 7th century. So what is this result of Brahmagupta? Brahmagupta, this is the Brahmagupta's composition law. It was called Bhavna. in ancient indian mathematics and that's why there is a mathematics magazine we it has been named bhavna bhavna it is referring to this brahmagupta's composition law so the composition law says that if x1 y1 z1 and x2 y2 z2 are solutions of n is fixed nx square plus z equal to y square then so is x1 y2 plus x2 y1 nx1 x2 plus y1 y2 and z1 z2 so that means that he is giving the on the solution space a composition law way back in 7th century so this idea the, this is the first time the principle of manif- uh, composition manifested in manif- in mathematics so you can see how far ahead he was in time and this sophisticated idea of constructing a binary composition on abstractly defined unknown elements is a central theme in modern mathematics research so i'll just give you an idea that even in modern maths how far it is to us so if you study mathematics and all um, most of you are from mathematics so you see that in bsc you are introduced to abstract structures groups rings when you go to msc then what you start doing is associating abstract structures to mathematical objects for example you have polynomial with that you associate its group of permutation of roots which is now called galois group that's at the msc level sometimes this is also taught in bsc at a research level and specialized research level you do this construct a binary composition till now you have natural binary compositions but you construct a binary composition on an important set that means you impart an abstract structure for example you know about elliptic curve there is a law of addition addition law on elliptic curves that is given any two points you add them to get a third point there is a way of doing that and brahmagupta is working at this level because he is giving you this is not a natural uh, this is like a multiplication of two integers he brahmagupta who was a founder of classical algebra he soars to the top layer of modern abstract algebra that is uh, the idea of constructing binary composition to achieve something so he gives a com- construction it's a not a natural given construction he constructs an operation on the solution space to find the solution to the equation so this this approach to mathematics is amazing so this is an example of what i would say that ability to discover new things the concept of composition which is at the heart of modern abstract algebra he discovered it matter of fact way now what was the context so this is called varga prakriti square natured so it was called pels equation nowadays it is being uh, renamed as brahmagupta pels equation so you have to find uh, suppose n is not a square you have to find uh, positive integers so that nx square plus 1 equal to y square you can see one obvious motivation see if n is not a uh, perfect square then root n cannot be written as y by x 
but what would be the best value of y by x which would uh, uh, you know satisfy root n which would be close to root n. So, if, if root n had it been equal to y by x then what you do you would have you would have n x square. So, n x square equal to y square, but n x square cannot be equal to y square then you would say the next best n x square plus 1 equal to y square find x and y such that n x square plus 1 equal to y square then y by x will be a good approximation to root n and if you can find a method to generate higher and higher values of y by x then it will be give better and better approximations. Now, the sophistication in this you can see that the smallest positive integer satisfying let us say something like 61 x square plus 1 equal to y square which is a problem stated by Bhaskara is so huge. Now, using Brahmagupta's composition law, Brahmagupta himself gave partial solution in 628, and the complete solution was given by Jayadev, uh, that is sometime before 1073, by what is known as the Chakravala or cyclic method, Bhaskara, Charya, and Narayan Pandit. And then this approximation to rational approximation of root n was given by Narayana. Pharma stated the same problem as a challenge in order to inspire mathematicians to number theory. And Andrevel, a giant of uh, you know 20th century mathematics says, what would have been Fermat's astonishment if some missionary just back from India had told him that his problem had been successfully tackled there by native mathematician almost 6 centuries earlier. Now, I told you about the letter of David Mumford you know that it was what you said that uh, that Brahmagupta is a key person in the creation of algebra as we know it. Now, since this was a personal letter, uh, Mumford permission was sought to publish his letter in one of my articles in Bhavna and of course, he gave the permission. Then that article was sent to him as courtesy and then he re replied, this is 10 years later. I still believe wholeheartedly that Brahmagupta was the real inventor of algebra. Diophantus introduced one unknown, but could not deal with two or uh, uh, but could not deal with two unknowns or with substitution and this made his writings obscure. And the law of composition with Pell's equation is true algebra, a clear glimpse of modern abstract algebra. Okay. So, what I have been talking about this is something which is repeated by Mumford himself. And in I will tell you, give you something interesting, this is a talk which you can hear in that uh, Manjul Bhargav's talk on Ramanujan on 22nd December 2020, that is Ramanujan's birthday. So, he was asked at the end of his talk to name mention the most creative mathematicians in whose work he found that magical quality which is present in Ramanujan. So, he first mentioned about An, uh, Andrew Wiles, his supervisor who solved Fermat's last theorem and then uh, Barry Mazur and Conway. Then he said that if I go further back then Gauss and if I go still further back is Brahmagupta. What he did around 600 just blows your mind. He used this uh, expression. It is there in YouTube. It blows your mind. Unfortunately, at least thanks to Abhankar there is an institute named after Bhaskaracharya, but there is I do not know of any institute anywhere named after Brahmagupta. Only thing I know is that in TIFR there is a hostel named after Brahmagupta. Sometime back in, our, in 20 years ago there was a proposal to have a special fellowship. I mean the special fellowship is there to name it after uh, uh, um, mathematician. So, idea, uh, so, ideas were sought. I had suggested the name of Brahmagupta and with the result it was decided not to name it after anybody. Now, uh, two more uh, topics. One is basic trigonometry. The sine and cosine functions were invented in India. In India, the sine function was called J or jiva, this in Arab pronunciation became jiva and that got confused with an Arab word jive for Arab word for heart called jive. 
So, when the Latin translation of Arabic word was made, they confused, they thought that the sign function has to be named heart for some reason. So, they named it by the Latin word for heart that is sinus and that became in English sign. So, the thing is that you know all this originated in India is Bakwas you can see the etymology, why sign is named after sign, what was it named before, Jaib and Jaib comes from Jai. The trigonometric formulae for sin A plus B, sin A minus B, cos A plus B, cos A minus B, sin A cos B plus cos S and B, all these formulae occur in Bhaskaracharya. And what is more, Indians imparted an algebraic character to trigonometry. They constructed accurate sign tables. They gave interpolation formula. So, if you have a sign table to how to read the intermediate, I mean, uh, value from the table. So, they gave, uh, so this led to finite differences, and that finite differences was a step towards calculus because, after all, what is finite differences? f of x plus h minus fx, right? right? And divided by h. So, as h becomes small, you uh, arrive at calculus. So, this calculus inv was invented in India, this shocks people who do not realize that this was a very natural consequence of the interpolation formula of Aryabhata. Aryabhata gave linear interpolation formula and Brahma Gupta gave quadratic interpolation formula. So, after that calculus was very natural because Brahma Gupta gives this formula. Having arrived at this much, is not it natural that calculus would emerge as because as h tends to small, h becomes small you arrive at calculus. So, this is equivalent to Newton Stirling formula for second order. So, differentials like d sin theta is cos theta d theta, it occurs in a 10th century mathematician Manjula and in Bhaskar Acheta. All these things are coming, uh, I mean these differentials were coming in the context of astronomy where you have the instantaneous uh, velocity. There are remarkable approximations for pi. For example, Aryabhata gave uh, the value 3.1416, which is you know the correct value up to four places. Next is Madhavacharya. First exact formula for pi. So, I said Aryabhata gave approximate formula. There are many approximate formulae, but the exact formula for pi as an infinite series was given by Madhavacharya. And when Leibniz, you know, is a co founder of calculus in Europe, when Leibniz discovered the formula by himself as an application of his calculus, he was very thrilled. But three, three centuries before Leibniz, it occurs in Madhavacharya. Now, this series is very slow. So, you, you can, can, cannot use this series to compute uh, pi. So, Madhava also gives correction terms for the remainder. That means, if you uh, if you terminate at the stage n, then the tail of that you can approximate by that rational expression. It is not exact, it is rational, but it gives a good value. Because, so, this is equality, the first, this is equality and this is approximation. The Newton's formula for sin x and cos x, these things occur in Madhavacharya. Nothing to get shocked if you look at the work of Aryabhata Brahma Gupta, it is a progression. Inverse image of uh, that is formula for tan inverse, which is called Gregory formula. Nowadays, it is called being called Madhava Gregory formula. And they also says that this is, uh, this will hold only for theta between 0 and 45, that is also mentioned. Now, ideas of calculus which and the proofs are given in Yukti Bhasha, a book of 16th century and the ideas of calculus that you see in their proof, integration as a limit of summation, expansion and turbine term integration, awareness of convergence and then limit formulae like this. Uh, these things again occur in Pharma in uh, 17th century. Now, in the process, because I talked about very broad things. In the process, certain things have got omitted. So, let me mention uh, some of them. Like Pingalacharya's, how he computed, Pingalacharya was mentioned again by Professor Borse, that how to compute 2 to the power n very rapidly. So, 2 to the power n, you can just say 2 into 2 n times. So, that means n minus 1 operations. But using the divide and conquer strategy, which will be later used by Aryabhata in his Kutaka, he gave a very quick method of computing 2 to the power n. Then again, Professor uh, Borsal already mentioned 
that he gave a way of coding and decoding of chandas like so in sanskrit there is uh, laghu and guru two kinds of uh, this syllables so uh, the so suppose you think of laghu as uh, zero and guru as one so it is like a so any meter is like a sequence of zeros and ones now when you write things on sand then something may get uh, you know disappear so therefore they thought of a strategy pingala thought of a strategy to serially order all the chandas and that ordering will give the rank so that will be the code of the chanda now so from so the point is now given a chanda how to quickly determine its rank and given a number how to recover the chanda of which that number is the rank so he gives formula for coding and decoding and that is equivalent to you know binary numbers are at the heart of modern computer how to convert a binary number to a decimal number and a decimal number to a binary number then pascal triangle those of you who know pascal triangle that is given by pingala that uh, arrangement for ncr sridhar acharya gives the herigon uh, uh, i mean the formula which uh, occurs in europe in 17th century that fundamental formula of commutator is ncr is you know this then the fibonacci sequence occurs in virahanka vn equal to vn minus 1 and in a much more aesthetic context so this is about so the thing is that there as i said laghu and guru there are two kinds of things so laghu is given matra 1 and guru is given matra 2 so how many chandas are there of matra n so how will you get it okay the last one may be either laghu or guru there are two, only two possibilities so if it is laghu then it is getting value 1 that means the previous one would add up to n minus 1 that can be that happens in vn minus 1 ways the other possibility is that the last is guru that means it got 2 that means the previous ones added up to n minus 2 that can happen in vn minus 2 ways so vn is vn minus 1 plus vn minus 2 how natural thing and fibonacci gives it in terms of very absurd things like you know incestuous breeding of rabbits um then identities on series like arithmetic progression this occurs in aryabhata geometric progression occurs in sridhar acharya then approximations for square root for example this bakshali manuscript has a remarkable approximation for a square root brahma gupta and bhaskar acharya introduce infinity in mathematics that is again a topic by itself so i'll uh, end with a quote again i i had been mentioning about jawaharlal nehru's discovery of india which was not written by a mathematician now sri aurobindo writes in foundations of indian culture and you see amazing insight that he has into the history so it is now proved that in science india went farther than any country before the modern era and even europe owes the beginning of her physical science to india as much to as much as to greece although not directly but through the medium of the arabs but within science you see that he first begins with mathematics especially in mathematics astronomy and chemistry the chief elements of ancient science india discovered and formulated much and well that means discovered much and formulated well and anticipated by force of reasoning or experiments some of the scientific ideas so you did science as maths for today scientific ideas and discoveries which europe first arrived at much later now you think of brahmagupta's composition law such things of course will arrive at europe but much much later 1200 years later but when you it arrives at europe europe was able to base it more firmly by her new and completer method some references for knowing the geometry of the vedic period which as you know there is a tendency to deny is bibhudibhushan datta the science is a doyen of uh, mathematics uh, you know history of indian mathematics he was a dsc in applied mathematics by the way science of the sulva then datta and sing has uh, you know very comprehensive treatment of the mathematics in ancient india the first part is on arithmetic and the second part is on algebra then saraswati amma 
has an excellent book on geometry in India. And for articles what I would uh, uh, remind you is that there is this magazine Bhavna where so there is an interesting thing that when Manjul Bhargav got the Fields medal here in Pune this Pune University there was an international conference that was arranged independent of Fields medal on history of mathematics. But when Manjul got Fields medal a special talk was arranged in that conference on composition laws from Brahmagupta to Bhargav and I was requested to give the talk and I made the title Bhavna from Brahmagupta to Bhargav and that talk I gave here in Pune University and uh, CS Arvinda uh, so when the magazine was to be founded CS Arvinda thought of the title Bhavna for the magazine from that and he asked Manjul Bhargav uh, what he thinks of it and he says that this is of course something very uh, dear to my heart and Manjul Bhargav suggested to get an article from me for the inaugural issue. So in the, the first issue January 2017 I have written the Bhavna in mathematics and excerpts from that article is reproduced in the inner cover of every uh, issue to explain the, uh, to explain the terminology. And in October 2017, I had written uh, an article on weighted arithmetic mean and in fact, I got an award from the Indian Math Society for that, that I mean the first Satish Bhatnagar award was given to me for this article. Now from January 2022, I am writing serially on mathematics in ancient India and so far 8 parts have been completed. This year I could not write but I hope to resume it soon. So there you will uh, get full details in the flavor in which I have been talking. Uh, but uh, naturally in much more details. So the like the first issue is on geometry, the second uh, geometry in Vedic time. Second issue is on the computations in Vedic time and there I fully worked out what I mentioned about Pingalacharya that how his coding of chandas and decoding of chandas matches with the binary system. So it is given in a complete uh, mathematical rigorous mathematical way. I mean no nothing like hand waving and I uh, and CS Arvinda who is the editor in chief said that he has not come across this detailed treatment anywhere else. So I would uh, recommend that you could uh, look at this series for you know full, full details. So, so far I have come up to Brahmagupta's composition law I mean uh, you do not get uh, Madhava etc that will come later. Okay, thank you for your patience I think I have overshot the time. But.